Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing to, to see so many people out today. Uh, the topic today is going to, in the hierarchy of, of values and virtues or feelings, uh, whichever way it's going to be defined. None of those. Uh, it's, a very, <laughs> it's a very high and noble. Uh, we're going to be talking about love. Let me warm up the speaker a bit by uh, stepping a couple of rungs down that ladder and talk just a little bit about uh, genuine gratitude. Uh, and sometimes gratitude uh, is never enough, but it's, it's uh, uh, what it is and what I have to offer. Uh, uh, this uh, event would not be taking place uh, were it not for the uh, courtesy of Kelly Joyce director of the uh, Duggan Library, who's made the venue possible, and this particular venue, right outside of the archives, would not be possible were it not uh, uh, for uh, Jennifer Duplega, uh, the archivist. Um, many of you would not be here were it not for the efforts of the uh, uh, communication and marketing folk uh, who have advertised it. And especially, I think, uh, I hope I've got this right, Matt Maltan, who provided the wonderful photograph of, of our speaker today. <laughs> <laughs> Signed copies will be available. Uh, and uh, uh, I need to thank, uh, I suspect, uh, Ron Wells and the physical plant for the setup uh, to uh, Lori Hedges, who I suspect organized things, but to Yao Wen, who is making sure that today's lecture will be recorded for future reference. Uh, to Michaela Owens and her staff, who provided food for us immediately uh, after uh, today's lecture, there will be an, an informal reception. And of course, uh, for someone who could not be here uh, today, but without whose help, none of you uh, would be here today, and that's uh, Elsa Convoy in the Office of Academic Affairs. And again, I say, is, is gratitude enough? No, but it's, uh, it's what we've got. <coughs> and uh, as I've already indicated, thanks to uh, all of you individually and collectively for being here for the 49th uh, lecture by a recipient of the uh, Arthur and Eileen uh, item Award for Distinguished Teaching. The 2016 recipient uh, of the award is Michael Duffy, Professor of Theology. I doubt very seriously that Mike will answer the question that he's posed to us, is love enough? But I'm absolutely confident that he will cause us, or he will force us, or he will challenge us, uh, to think uh, both about the question and all of the possible answers to it and any number of other things uh, in the course of, of this talk uh, this afternoon. For after all, that's uh, what Mike Duffy has done for 22 years, uh, day in. <laughs> Excuse me. It's true. 22 plus years. A day in, day out, term in, term out, year in, year out, uh, in his long and distinguished career at the college. Uh, he challenges his students, he challenges his faculty colleagues, uh, he challenges everyone to ask the questions that uh, we don't think to ask. Uh, he asks the questions that sometimes we don't dare ask. Uh, questions that may make us feel uncomfortable, though I don't think today is such an example. Uh, <laughs> and then he gives us the, both the freedom uh, and, the, uh, and the tools and the power uh, to answer those questions for ourselves with some form of, of integrity and to some degree of sufficiency. So please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Michael Duffy. Thank you. Congratulations. Who's going to let us know whether indeed love is enough? It is, totally. <laughs> See ya. 
food over there. Oh, thanks a lot, Steve. Um, and thanks so much for coming. It's really nice to see all of you. Some of you I haven't seen in a good while. Um, not because I'm on sabbatical, but because you are living out there in the world somewhere and, uh, uh, and very kindly came in today. So that's really nice. It's nice to see you. I guess I should say a thank you to, um, or at least send one out into the cosmos to um, Arthur and Eileen Bynum or their estate and heirs or uh, whoever it is for funding a teaching award here at Hanover. And I certainly want to thank students and alums uh, who were instrumental both in nominating uh, me for this award um, and ultimately for uh, voting it in my direction. That means more than I can even try to say, so I'm just not going to. As the title suggests, the question I want to try to answer this afternoon is whether love is enough. Obviously, that's going to require that I talk a good bit about what love is and what I mean by enough. Um, Bonnie and I were met in the parking lot when we came in by someone who assumed that the question I was going to answer is, is love enough for sex? Um, I'm not actually going to talk about that at all. Um, I have no idea why the person thought that's what I was going to talk about, but, uh, but I'm not, and I'm going to talk about some other things instead. In my, in my, um, but when I get that far, the answer will be yes, actually. It is enough. Or at least being loving is enough. But it's going to take me a few steps to get to that place. Um, I hope you'll enjoy the journey as, uh, as we go through this talk. Uh, I hope that it gives you at least something useful to um, build something of a loving life on or something worth thinking about. Well, I want to begin by telling you about my dad. My dad was born in 1926 when his mother was 30 and he grew up surrounded by a large extended family on a working farm in rural Connecticut. Between 1943 and 1945 he served in the army doing primarily communications work such things as running wire, operating switchboard, operating radios, both here in the States and, and in, in Italy. Italy. With the exception of those two years, he spent his first 85 years living in the tiny town of Marbledale, so-called because of its marble quarries. He married my mom in the town's one church, St. Andrew's Episcopal, the church in which he grew up, the church in which I grew up, and the church in which my grand, or for which my grandmother, his mother, played the organ when she was a teenager. Working nights and weekends between roughly 1960 and 1962, Dad built the house that I grew up in. His mortgage was roughly $90 a month, which he could barely afford in the early 60s. And I well remember his and Mom's joy on the day that was paid off. I don't know if I'll ever experience that joy, but um, <laughs> it was nice to experience it in Dad's case. I learned a lot from my dad. I learned, for example, something about how to run property lines in the days when one actually unrolled a steel tape with numbers printed on it instead of setting up a computerized distance reader, and when one actually did math and drew maps by hand. I learned that sometimes measuring and marking a few hundred feet of property line had to be preceded by several hours of cutting brush with machetes, whether in the middle of a hot summer or the middle of a nice brisk New England winter with a couple of feet of snow covering the stone walls that were de facto boundary markers. I learned that playing catch with a baseball in the backyard can be soothing exercise in itself as well as a bonding time for a father and son. For better or for worse, being able to throw and catch was pretty much the extent of my baseball skills. My dad loved the sport. He played it in high school. He played on a town team for many years, and he was a huge Boston Red Sox fan. To his credit, 
He was wholly supportive of me when I chose track and field instead of baseball in high school. When I asked, asked him decades later if he had been disappointed in my choice, he just smiled a bit and shrugged a little and said, well, maybe a little bit, but you loved what you were doing. I'm not sure what he thought about the fact that to the extent I cared at all, I rooted for the Yankees instead of his beloved Red Sox. I learned from my dad both commitment to hard work and the importance of showing up. Dad worked at the same job for 38 years, commuting about 20 miles each way, always arriving early so that he was actually ready to work, as opposed to being ready to begin to get ready to work at the hour that he was supposed to be there. If getting to work early meant shoveling three or four feet of snow out of our very steep driveway, then obviously dad got up earlier than his usual 5 or 5.30, because that's just what one does. Dad grew up on the farm, he lived through the depression, and one worked as hard as one had to, sometimes at as many jobs as one had to, in order to fulfill one's responsibilities and support one's family. If, as was sometimes the case, the boss at work, or the minister at church, or the guys in his survey crew were a pain in the neck, or if one wasn't feeling well, or if one's personal life was in chaos, it didn't really matter. You got up, you showed up, and you did your part well. That's what life is about. I learned from my dad some basic carpentry skills, emphasis on the basic, how to quickly coil long ropes on one's hand and elbow, that pushing a lawnmower for a few hours can actually be kind of fun, that collecting coins as a hobby is engaging, and that rock music isn't real music. <laughs> he and I didn't actually agree on that. For some reason, he's sort of like Benny Goodman and the big bands instead of Steppenwolf and Aerosmith, but what can I tell you? I learned from Dad devotion to family, devotion to God, that every human being deserves respect, and that one should volunteer one's time to better one's church and one's community. My dad was a real human being with real human faults, but he was a very good man and a very good father and an exemplar for me in many, many dimensions of my life. In 1995, just before my dad retired, my mother died of complications from ovarian cancer. And dad suffered. And he suffered. And he survived it in about the only way that one can survive such things, one day at a time, one hour at a time, one minute at a time, making it through by working on every project around the house or the church that he could find or create, singing with a community group or two, spending occasional meals with a small circle of friends, and in his case, praying on his knees every day, sometimes many times a day. A few months after mom died, he ended up in the hospital for a couple of weeks, unofficially diagnosed by one of his doctors as having a broken heart. In 2010 or so, Family and friends began to notice that dad was struggling with some memory-related issues. Following a diagnosis of vascular dementia, my sister and I moved him into an assisted living center in the fall of 2011, entirely against his wishes. He has lived in that center for the last five and a half years, spending most of that time in their memory care unit. The center is a few miles away from the town where he spent his first 85 years, marking the first time he's lived outside of Marbledale since 1945. I love my dad, but I struggle both with what that means at the level of action and with whether loving him is enough. He loves music, so we got him a CD player and CDs, but it's been years now since he's been able to work the CD player. We got him a phone so that we could talk with him regularly. But he refuses to wear his hearing aids, so he can't hear us, no matter how high the volume is turned up. We now call him on one of his nurse's phones, which seems to work better for him, 
though of course it deprives the nurse of a phone while we're talking. It's unclear at the beginning of our phone exchanges, and it would be difficult, I think, to call them conversations, that Dad knows who I am, though he seems to by the end. As we talk, he sometimes confuses my sister, her daughter, and her daughter. I think they all fall now into the category of little blonde girls. As far as I know, he doesn't remember these phone conversations for more than a few minutes after we hang up. And as his world becomes smaller and smaller, his long-term memory is also fading. Thanks to being able to cobble together social security payments, pension payments, long-term care insurance payments, and money from the sale of dad's home, we've been fortunate enough, privileged enough, to be able to provide him with very good, good care, but that money is quickly running out. I don't know or really have any way of knowing what dad's internal life looks like, or whether anything that we're doing for him makes his life better or simply prolongs his misery. I am certain that had I ever shown him a crystal ball that revealed possible futures, he would absolutely not have chosen this one for himself. On occasion, when he had the ability to describe his inner state more clearly, he would express his desire to die, something that his strong body isn't going to allow anytime soon, I expect. I love my dad. I wrestle all the time with whether loving him, being loving to him, is enough. Now, as I suggested when I began, I think the answer is yes, that being loving is enough. But I also don't think that's especially obvious. And the question becomes much more complicated and debatable when we add greater numbers of people and more complex power structures to the mix. So I'll come back to my dad in a few minutes. But at this point, I want to break off from his story for a bit and talk in a more focused way about this thing we call love. And as I do this, the first thing that strikes me is how many large and significant claims are made on love's behalf. Here are a few examples. According to both the Dalai Lama, whose book on encounters with the world's faith traditions I've been using recently in my theology and ethics class, and historian Karen Armstrong, whose call for a charter for compassion has touched millions of people and hundreds of communities, including Louisville, the golden rule and the virtue of compassion, which for my purposes I'm going to see as essentially the same as love, are at the heart of the moral teachings of Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, all the major religions of the world. And they are the keys to how we should treat one another and to how we can bring greater peace to a divided world. We do not, of course, have to appeal to religious tr traditions to find upbeat and hopeful recommendations concerning love. A couple of weeks ago, I read an article by Clay Ferris Naff entitled Make America, excuse me, Make America Kind Again in the most recent issue of The Humanist magazine. This is Naff's concluding sentence about how to make America kind again. Like the civil rights marchers, we must rise up to meet tribal fear, hostility, and hate with determined, courageous, and humanistic love. Here's another quotation. This one from the late Catholic priest and social activist Daniel Berrigan. This is from a 1965 lecture. So the hope here is that the conscience of humanity, even as violence escalates, is also emerging in a profound counter-movement of love, which expresses itself not narrowly in opposition to war, but in works of compassion all over the world, which is, of course, the largest and most positive sense in which this idea of nonviolence can be taken. A year later, in 1966, 
medical ethicist and moral theorist Joseph Fletcher, in his controversial book Situation Ethics, argued that when it comes to moral decision making, love is the only norm. Some of Nafs and Berrigan's themes are echoed in this admittedly partisan January 21st Facebook post from Senator Bernie Sanders. President Trump, by trying to divide us up by race, religion, gender, and nationality, you have actually brought us closer together. Black, white, Latino, Native American, Asian American, gay or straight, male or female, native born or immigrant, we will fight bigotry and create a government based on love and compassion, not hatred and divisiveness. And here's a quotation from former Hanover sociology major, Allison Adair. And this was in a Facebook post about why Ali was participating in the recent Women's March in DC. <coughs> I march because I want my children and your children to be born into a country that values love and equality more than dissent and derision. I march because I believe all children should have the same opportunities as mine. I march because love is a verb. I march not with fear. I march not with hate. I march with love. Because love that moves us to action can and will change the world. Finally, here's a powerful quotation that doesn't mention love. I was online a couple of weeks ago listening to a recent lecture by public philosopher and political activist Cornell West. He was lifting up and then responding to some questions that civil rights activist W.E.B. Du Bois raised in 1957 in a work of historical fiction entitled The Ordeal of Mansart. Du Bois' questions gave me a way to point to the intensity that I think lies within the love question. Here's what Du Bois originally wrote. How shall integrity face oppression? What shall honesty do in the face of deception, decency in the face of insult, self-defense before blows? How shall desert and accomplishment meet despising, detraction, and lies? What shall virtue do to meet brute force? There are so many answers, and they can be so contradictory. And there are such differences for those on the one hand who meet questions similar to this once a year or once a decade, and those who face them hourly or daily. With all of these quotations and challenges echoing in our ears then, I ask again whether love is enough. Is it enough in the face of my dad's dementia and declining life force? How about when we're faced with the several of our family members and friends who are likely to be in distress of some kind at any given moment in our lives? How about in the face of struggling relationships or anxiety about the future? Is love a uniting force on which a government can be based? Is it a sufficient norm for moral decision making? Is it an antidote in the face of hatred? Will it change a broken world? Is it enough in the face of offensive or corrupt or illegal or science denying or fabricated claims, orders, or decisions by the President and Congress? How about in the face of bigotry or religious exclusivity? Is it enough in the face of racism, sexism, homo hysteria, homophobia, transphobia, human trafficking, sexual assault? How about the face of poverty, significant reductions in quality health care for women and children, or the potential widespread revocation of or cost prohibitive nature of medical insurance? Is love enough in the face of those things? Given that I have a room full of critical thinkers here, I imagine that you are quietly sending thoughts to me like, Duffy, define your terms. What do you mean by love? Well, that's a good question. On at least two grounds. First, it's always good to know what one is talking about. 
Second, I've been blending together several different meanings of the word. When it comes to love, we can be talking about many different things. There's something different about loving my dad and loving my wife. And both of these are different than my love of my sister or of my love of my friend Dave Castle here. And those are something rather different than I mean when I tell my students that I love them, which I do. So what do I mean by love? Well, I mean something like what Howard Thurman meant when he wrote this. Love is the intelligent, kindly but stern expression of kinship of one individual for another, having as its purpose the maintenance and furtherance of life at its highest level. Or something like what Trappist monk Thomas Merton wrote in Wisdom of the Desert. Love means an interior and spiritual identification with one's brother or sister so that she or he is not regarded as an object to which one does good. Love takes one's neighbor as one's other self and loves her or him with all the immense humility and discretion and reserve and reverence without which no one can presume to enter into the sanctuary of another's subjectivity. From such love, all authoritarian brutality, all exploitation, domineering, and condescension must necessarily be absent. And I mean, of course, something like what Luke has in mind in his story of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10. A man is beaten, robbed, and left for dead on the side of the road. After some supposedly good and righteous folks pass by him, a person who is widely despised sees him lying there, notices his suffering, stops, tends to his wounds, and takes him to a safe place so that he can recuperate and recover. And the Good Samaritan promises to return with payment for whatever care is needed. In response to these and many other reflections, I think love is best understood as the active commitment to the well-being of the other. I think this is how we should be thinking about, talking about, and expressing love. Many of you will recognize that I'm working with something very close to the New Testament's agape love, or what is often called neighbor love. But I'm not using that language because I think it's too easy, us, too easy for us to think we know what we're talking about when we say those kinds of things. Also, frankly, commitment to the well-being of the other, appropriately explained and expanded, is what I'm going to mean when I talk about love, whether or not this way of thinking about it expresses the meaning of agape or neighbor love. So I'm not here using those traditional concepts as norms against which I'm measuring love. Given that, let me fill in a few of the details that are important in making sense of this commitment to well-being. First, I submit that this love is the basis or the ground of the other loves that I mentioned before. There's an additional something going on when we're talking about romantic or sexual love or parental love or the love between friends. But none of these other loves would work without a grounding in this active commitment to the well-being of the other. I may, for instance, have common interests with or sexual attraction to someone, but that seems a more superficial matter, that is, it seems a more superficial matter to call those things love if there is not, at the same time, a commitment to the person's well-being. Feelings and desires are certainly important, crucial even, in many loves. But the real work of love, maybe even the real pleasure of love, comes with acting for the well-being of the other. Second, this love is a fact-based love. Because what contributes to human well-being or human flourishing is not, at least mostly, a matter of opinion. A full-blown full -blown view of well-being would be informed by something like the Catholic view of the common good, 
which Vatican II defines as the sum total of all those conditions of social life which allow social groups and their individual members relatively thorough and ready access to their fulfillment. It would be informed by the kinds of things that political philosopher John Rawls says in A Theory of Justice and a bunch of other places about natural and social primary goods. In the first case, we have things like health and intelligence and imagination, and in the second, we have things like power and opportunities and civil rights and self-respect or the bases of self-respect. It would include discussion of the kinds of needs that psychologist Abraham Maslow discusses in his theory of motivation. I don't have any thoughts on whether hierarchy or interrelationship or some other metaphor is the best one here, but surely necessities for human well-being include food, water, safety, friends, and the like. And finally, a complete discussion of well-being would ponder things such as Michael Shermer seems to have in mind when in a discussion between Shermer and Sam Harris that appears on Harris's website, Shermer defines human flourishing as having adequate sustenance, safety, shelter, bonding, and social relations for physical and mental health. Now obviously I can't fill in this concept of well-being in any complete way today, but it is a matter of facts what enables the well-being or flourishing of humans. And importantly, whatever human well-being includes, it does not, in the end, include being hated or abused or discriminated against or starved or tortured or rejected or abandoned or made to feel useless or uncared for. Third, this love is hope-based because it is uncertainty-constrained. Let me say that again. This love is based in hope because it is constrained by uncertainty. It's a reality of our lives that we don't know what the next minute is going to bring. It often seems that we do, I suppose because there's a certain consistency to our experiences much of the time, but it doesn't take long before we realize that the symbolic power, or sorry, before we realize the symbolic power of the middle of the night phone call that brings unwanted news. We can't predict at any moment what may happen to change our lives, and we can't predict with certainty the effects of any of our actions, including our loving ones. This means that acting in love is a matter of hope. Hope that the good that I intend will actually occur. We're not told in the story of the Good Samaritan whether the man recovers. He might die. We don't know. We hope not. I can't know whether my dad is positively affected by my phone calls, but I hope he is. I can't know whether we're spending money in the best possible way for his extended care, but we're trying to, and I hope we are. I can't tell whether attempting to teach others how to distinguish facts from alternative facts will promote their well-being and flourishing but I certainly hope so. An intention to affect the world positively through phone calls to senators or protesting in the streets or running for office or trying to reform the Democratic Party may or may not have positive results because such intentions are hope-based and not certainty-based, but motivated by love, they seem worth doing even required for those of us with appropriate gifts. Fourth, the other who is referred to in this way of thinking about love as commitment to the well-being of the other includes the self. How to balance the well-being of the self with the well-being of the other is one of the most stubborn practical problems faced by anybody who chooses to love. Sometimes it's even difficult to know in which direction the balance is off. It's a very extreme case, but I once visited a young man in the hospital who had tried to end his own life 
because he thought that his, his death might bring his divided city together. Leaving aside the obvious mental health issues that were certainly addressed, this could be seen as an example of an exaggerated sense of self or as the giving up of the self. The last I knew, by the way, several years had gone by and he was doing well. At any rate, it is possible to put others first to such an extent that we diminish or evaporate the self, just as it is possible to put others second to such a degree that we descend into a soul-killing greed or selfishness. As we struggle to balance self and other, it's important to remember that self and other are both to be loved. The well-being of both is at stake. Fifth, love as the fact-based, hope-based, uncertainty-constrained commitment to the well-being of self and other <laughs> naturally grows, I think, in the life of the person who is open to what she or he feels, to what others feel, and or to knowledge about the self and the world. In a new book that I think I will be able to say that I enjoyed once I actually read it, <laughs> physician Ronald Epstein, and the book is entitled Attending Medicine, Mindfulness, and Humanity, Physician Ronald Epstein says this, Compassion is the triad of noticing another's suffering, resonating with their suffering in some way, and then acting on behalf of the other person. Noticing, resonating, acting. To notice, of course, requires us to be open. We can't walk by and ignore a hurting person if we're committed to loving committed to the well-being of people. We can't avoid reading some news if we're trying to be loving. We can't ignore the effects of the constant lying of the current administration, Trump administration, as our circle of care ex expands beyond those, thought I better add that, expands <laughs> beyond those nearest to us. And as we do these things, as we notice, we are, I think, compelled to respond in some way. Noticing suffering and knowing the facts about situations of suffering or impending suffering, think here about issues related to climate change or vaccinations, inspire our loving, which until and unless we close ourselves off and become unliving, unloving, sorry, naturally expands outward in concentric circles to include all of sentient life, the environment, and to use a religious metaphor, creation. Sixth, understood in the way that I've proposed it, love includes justice. This is controversial. Western philosophical and theological traditions contain extensive discussions about the best way to understand the relationships between these two great principles and virtues. It is sometimes said, for example, that justice concerns the obligations that institutions or the state have to individuals and groups, while love concerns how individuals should treat one another. Or, that justice concerns the recognition of basic rights, while love is about additional dimensions of human flourishing. For me, treating people justly is simply part of what it means to be committed to their well-being. To fail to recognize, either as an, inst as an individual or an institution, that all persons, as persons, are to be respected equally, is to fail in love. Our active commitment to the well-being of others must include, as my friend Barry Penhaller succinctly puts it, engagement with the social, economic, and political institutions that so profoundly shape our lives and those we are called to love. Well, I hope these explanations put some kind of flesh on the bones of my definition. We still need one more exploration, though. We still need to ask what we mean by the word enough. You remember that I started talking about my dad. And at some level, the answer to the problem in his case is easy if what we mean is love enough 
to give my dad back a life where he can be in his own home by himself and mow his lawn and stand on a ladder to paint the second story trim and do survey jobs and have his wife and children with him, then the answer is no. Love is not enough. If my goal in teaching is to be sure that all of my students will be able to retire wealthy at the age of 40, I'm sorry, or be happy every day of their lives, then no, love is not enough. If my intention in protesting, say, the defunding of Planned Parenthood is to guarantee for all time our society's commitment to the well-being of women, love is not enough. If I define enough in terms of the guaranteed or of the impossible, then love is not and never will be enough. But I think that's an unhelpful way to think about the question. We don't learn anything by saying that love can't do what can't be done. Theologian Sharon Welch, in a 1990 book entitled The Feminist Ethic of Risk, used insights from African American women's fiction to inform her discussion of communities of resistance and the disarmament movement. And she wrote what I think are very wise words. We assume that to be responsible means that one can ensure that the aims of one's action will be carried out. We assume that to act means to determine what will happen through that single action, to ensure that a given course of events comes to pass. This understanding of responsible action leads to a striking paralysis of will when faced with large, complex problems. It seems natural to many people, when faced with a problem too big to be solved alone or within the foreseeable future, simply to do nothing. Recognizing the flawed nature of human beings in their societies and the uncertainties always attached to the consequences of our actions, Welch builds a case for communities of resistance that are empowered by love. And in doing so, she, at least implicitly, sets up a contrast between the enough of achieving an end and the enough of responsible loving action. And although the point isn't exactly the same, there's a certain resonance between these ideas and another one that has long interested me. In 1987, psychologist Bruno Bettelheim published a book called The Good Enough Parent. And in the preface, he writes this. In order to raise a child well, one ought not try to be a perfect parent, as much as one should not expect one's child to be or become a perfect individual. Perfection is not within the, ordinary, the grasp of ordinary human beings. Efforts to attain it typically interfere with that lenient response to the imperfections of others, including those of one's child, which alone make good human relations possible. I don't know anything about parenting, but I like the language of good enough and its connection in what Bettelheim said to the notion of becoming. One should not expect one's child to become perfect. That's not an argument in support of mediocrity. It's an argument in support of the loving over the guaranteed or impossible. The parent can't guarantee that her or his children are going to end up in a given place. The doctor can't guarantee that her patient is going to be cured. The teacher can't guarantee that his students are going to be successful by any measure of success. The one who resists discrimination or evil or ignorance or oppression can't guarantee it will be eliminated. But the parent can be committed in intention and expression to the well-being of her or his children. The doctor can be committed to the well-being of his patients. The teacher can be committed to the well-being of her students. The resistor can be committed to the well-being of those who are adversely affected by injustice. Loving action is responsible action in the present. Nothing is guaranteed for the future. I can't take my father back to an earlier time of vigor and joyful life. I can, however, 
give him the pleasure of a four-minute phone call from the son whose voice he still recognizes. And I can be as smart and frugal as possible with the money that exists, spending it carefully on what will in the best judgment of family, friends, and caregivers enhance his well-being. These things are loving actions and are, given the real world, sufficient or enough. If love can be understood as the active commitment to the well-being of all, and if well-being has to do at least initially with the basic needs of human fulfillment, and if enough is defined in terms of informed, hopeful action and not guaranteed consequences, then being loving is enough, or at least it's good enough. It is what we can and must do, even if we can't bring perfection to any situation or fully achieve ends of justice or peace. Living out an active and fact-based commitment to the flourishing of all is the best we can do, and we hope it will change the world. A final point. Admittedly, this way of being loving, while it can counter both apathy and burnout, is hard work, and it's not so easily attained or sustained. At the very least, it takes the support and the courage of a community of those who would be loving. And for me, it takes one additional kind of commitment. My own attempts to be loving are sustained by my commitment to the view that the heart of the universe, despite appearances, is love. And here's a five-sentence statement, I think, of a theological method that I find convincing. This approach is based on the work of people like the late Mennonite theologian Gordon Kaufman, but these words are mine. We cannot know with intellectual certainty that there is any aspect of reality that could appropriately be called divine or gods or God. Convictions about the divine, however, pervade human history and the contemporary world and are not likely to disappear. Because beliefs about the divine inspire human action, for better and for worse, each one of us has a stake in encouraging views of the divine that enable us to express the highest human moral ideal, which, I submit, is love. And if one is going to believe in a god or other sacred authority for oneself, one ought to believe in one that is love or loving in the sense that we've been reflecting on. My personal commitment, which sustains my very frail attempts to be loving, is that the heart of the universe is love. Whether or not that's true, I find it to be a good way to live. I'm going to do everything that I can to enhance my dad's well-being. And I need to do the same when I am faced with bigotry and persecution and those who would impose suffering on others in order to enrich themselves. There is much that I do not and cannot know, and there is much that I cannot do. But that's the nature of love. In the face of uncertainty, and armed with the facts as best we can discern them, love is a sufficient guiding norm for our lives. It is enough. Indeed, the commitment to the well-being of all, expanding as it does through ever more inclusive circles of care, is what life is all about. There is, in the end, nothing more worth spending our lives doing than being loving. And if it should turn out that I'm wrong about all this, and that loving isn't enough, I think we would still have to admit that it's a heck of a good start. Thank you very much.